Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us at our SAGO Pro Bono Project fundraiser this afternoon. Um, I'm delighted with the response. We've had 155 delegates sign up for this afternoon. So on behalf of the directors and the administrators and the staff at the four labor court offices, we really are very grateful to you for your support. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to thank um, our three sponsors of the raffle prizes, um, being Saslaw, Lexus Nexus, and Labanet. Uh, Lexus Nexus and Labanet, long time supporters of Saslaw and its pro bono project, so thank you to them for the donation of the prizes. Um, we will do the um, raffle uh, announcements at the end of the presentation. The draw has already been done on a random selector app by Judge Benitez just now, so, uh, and that was all audited, so everything is um, unsedory. Um, on behalf of the directors and the project, I'd like to thank both judges for their time and for agreeing to, um, to present to you this afternoon on an important topic. And I'm not going to um, do any further introductions other than to hand over to Judge Benitez, who will be um, presenting first, and then we'll follow with Judge Gush. Um, feel free to ask questions by asking them in the question and answer platform on me. And um, thanks again, everybody. And over to Judge Benito. All right. Thank you very much for your attendance this afternoon. And um, just on behalf of the Labour Court, thank you to the SAS Law Pro Bono Project for the work they do. I mean, coincidentally, this morning I was talking to the registrar in Johannesburg, who again just complimented the SAS Law staff um, at the Pro Bono Clinic in Johannesburg and uh, noted that uh, their contribution is a welcome and invaluable one. Uh, so certainly, we as judges. Uh, echo that sentiment. So uh, thank you for your support this afternoon. What um, I want to suggest uh, this afternoon is that using virtual platforms during the course of the lockdown has demonstrated to us that we can transform the way in which the Labour Court functions. I'm going to come back to that, but um, it might be useful just to reflect on uh, the position BC before COVID. Um, the Labour Court, like any other High Court, ran opposed motion courts and unopposed motion court, an urgent court and trial courts. The busiest court, of course, is Johannesburg, where at uh, present we run three opposed motion courts, one unopposed motion court, one urgent court and three trial courts. Of course, in Durban, Cape Town and Port Elizabeth, things are mixed up a little, but um, that we found uh, certainly up until March this year to be the most efficient way to uh, manage the case role that we have. The constraints, as you'll be aware from prior SAS law discussions and conferences, uh, has always been the number of courts and the number of judges. And the judge president for some years has been trying to secure more judges for the Labour Court to deal with the increased workload. Um, of course, judges need courts and they need chambers, and uh, that has always been the major issue. Uh, we've tried to make um, interim accommodation arrangements by, for example, using two courts in the Land Claims Court in Randburg simply because we don't have enough in Bromfontein. And um, the need for new accommodation, uh, be it in, in Randburg, uh, trying to get more courts out of the land claims court has proved impossible, or in Bromfontein and trying to secure more space from the landlord there has proved to be more difficult than we imagined. Over the years, um, I mean, a number of innovations or interventions have been devised. I mean, I can think of the pre-enrolment hearings that was intended to 
weed out opposed motions that uh, you know, could be dealt with more robustly. Um, there's a new set of rules, and uh, you may recall that uh, I think in April 2018, the task team, which was uh, Shamima Gabi, uh, Anton Marburg, and myself, put together a draft set of rules, presented those to the board, and we are still waiting for a response. Uh, the intention of those was partly um, to increase efficiencies in uh, the way in which cases are managed in the Labour Court. At present, uh, <laughs> the situation is dire. Uh, we have a crisis of some proportions, especially in Port Elizabeth and Johannesburg. This has been occasioned largely by um, the, uh, the lockdown and especially at levels four and five when uh, certainly trials uh, were not able to run uh, for a variety of reasons. But um, as you're aware, uh, most of the opposed motions and certainly the urgent matters uh, proceeded uh, by way of virtual hearings. And um, it's, it's that which I'm going to come back to in a minute. Just to, just to give you a picture of how dire things are, um, if you want a date for an interlocutory application in Johannesburg. In other words, if you referred your statement of case two days late, the other side took the point and um, the matter is now to be determined. The registrar will allocate a date in September next year. Depending on the outcome of your application, of course, you may then want a trial date. If you ask Nelly for a trial date tomorrow, she'll give you one in 2022. Opposed, motion, opposed motions are, are faring no better. The fourth term of next year is all but full and uh, nearly soon going to start allocating matters for the first term of 2022. Um, in Port Elizabeth, and I was there a couple of weeks ago, uh, PE ordinarily has two judges. There's one permanently based, the others brought in. Um, and um, since March, there's only been one judge, which means that uh, there's a massive backlog, especially of opposed motions. And um, that uh, does not seem to, I don't think that's going to change for uh, in, in, in the immediate future. Cape Town and Durban seem to have coped better somehow. And uh, perhaps Judge Gush can say something about uh, Durban, but it seems to me Cape Town lost about four or five weeks. And um, I was told today that all of the trials that were removed during the course of the lockdown um, have been reallocated dates for hearing. But obviously, this is not a situation which can be sustained. Um, it, it, it makes a joke of the statutory purpose of expeditious dispute resolution. Um, and it, it just reinforces uh, the fact that the Labour Court uh, is the hurdle uh, in achieving uh, the statutory purpose of expeditious dispute resolution. Seems, I think seem to go fairly smoothly um, up until the date of, of any referral to, to the Labour Court. That's when the rules come off. Now, what's um, the lockdown and what, what uh, hearings on, on uh, virtual platforms has done? Uh, is to, I think, give pointers to some solutions and perhaps previously unimagined solutions. Uh, believe me, up until this year, we were still having judges meetings and circumstances where judges flew up uh, to Johannesburg um, for, uh, for a meeting, finished the meeting and flew back again. I, th I think, I think the, the, the concept of uh, being able to talk to one another uh, being able to conduct business, uh, being able to to um, to hold hearings uh, on on a on a virtual platform, has has opened eyes to to a number of possibilities, and um, I mean there were there were really two cases that I dealt with during the lockdown, which which brought this home to me. I mean, the first was a case brought by AMQ against the Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs. It dealt with uh, the regulation of um, or the management of the coronavirus on mines. Um, I mean, it, it was it was a massive case. It was set down for two days. Um, I counted up. Uh, there were there were ten counsel 
involved, and I forget how many attorneys. But um, we did it on Zoom, and um, everybody had their say, and the case was concluded on the 30th of April, and I handed down an order on the 1st of May. Now, what's significant about that is that no one had to come back to court for uh, to note judgment. The 1st of May was a public holiday, and uh, the judgment was emailed out to everybody uh, on that day to everybody's um, satisfaction. Um, the 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 other case was um, another fairly big one, Lumsa and the SAA business rescue practitioners. You may recall that it was a case involving the um, the giving of uh, uh, retrenchment notices um, in the absence of a business rescue plan. I mean, that was heard on one day, the 7th of May. Judgment was delivered the next day, the 8th of May, also on um, on uh, on email. So we did away with having to come to court to note judgments. We accommodated people who were out of town. In the AMCU matter, Richard Spur lives in White River. He was able to join us. In the uh, SAA matter, uh, Minar Newhouse is P Port Elizabeth based. Uh, he was able to join us. And uh, I, I think we ha held hearings that were extraordinarily efficient by labor court standards. Um, and uh, the fact that we could do all of that online, uh, I think was uh, was a, a, a contributor to a, a massive reduction in cost for the parties and uh, an increase in efficiency from the side of, of the labor court. So for, for me, the, the obvious lesson to be drawn here is, is that, uh, and I come back to the point about, you know, us being preoccupied about the number of courts we've got, is, is, is that the physical courtroom or the existence of a physical courtroom is, is really not a necessary condition for an efficient hearing. We've become used to the idea of conducting hearings in the absence of a physical courtroom, as I'm sure a lot of you um, have become used to conducting business in the absence of uh, an, an office on Ravonia Road and uh, a fancy boardroom. But um, what what this indicates uh, is, is uh, well, what, what this raises is an important question. We need to ask ourselves why it's necessary for parties to come to court to argue a case. Why is it necessary for them to come to court to note a judgment? Um, why do we need to continue um, a running uh, running litigation in the form that we uh, that that we that we have. Um, I think what this does, uh, it, in other words, to this idea of divorcing uh, efficient hearings from physical the physical trappings of of, of courts, uh, is to open a whole lot of possibilities. The one I thought of, and it's particularly pertinent to uh, today's audience. Uh, is, is, is simply this, uh, the pro bono judges, and we're always very grateful for their assistance, uh, they, they come in January and July. Uh, why? Because those are the months in which we have recess and those are therefore the months in which courtrooms are available. It, it seems to me that we could rethink the whole of the pro bono judge system. December, January and July, I'm sure, are not suitable times or not the best times for people who wish to make their services available on a pro bono basis to do so. Um, frankly, it, it, what, what pro bono uh, assistance um, might, in, might uh, uh, incorporate in future uh, is simply handing a pile of files to a judge who's agreed to act pro bono and having that judge work through those files in the in his or her chambers, uh, office, or, or home, and uh, using virtual hearings uh, to, to achieve that end. In other words, we could run pro bono courts throughout the course of the year, and uh, at a time that is far more convenient to pro bono judges than the times on which we currently uh, call on them to provide services. So the um, that's one example, I think, of um, of a way in which we could, uh, having drawing on the lessons we've learned, uh, think about how to do things differently. So the second, the second point, or the second lesson I've, I've learned, uh, is is that um, we need to seriously question the value of uh, of oral hearings. 
I mean, I was astounded, frankly, when uh, we gave parties the option during the lockdown of um, a hearing on paper in chambers without uh, any oral hearing at all, not even a hearing on Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams. The take up, uh, again, in my experience, and this seems to be shared by my colleagues, was anything between 30 and 50 percent. In other words, in, in half the cases that uh, were waiting to be heard, parties were happy to dispense with a hearing. They were happy for a judge, uh, sometimes with uh, the addition of um, supplementary arguments, to simply make the decision on the papers uh, in chambers. And that, to me, um, given the vast backlog that exists in respect of opposed motion matters, uh, holds out much promise. Uh, I can't see why we can't introduce a, uh, a kind of equivalent of the McDonald's drive through, you know, a fast track option where you can file your heads of argument in a review and say to the registrar, by consent, we're happy for a judge simply to decide this on the papers and chambers. You don't have to wait two years for a hearing date. You don't have to come to court to argue the matter. And frankly, in most cases, the argument presented is the rehash of what's in the heads anyway. Um, and you don't have to come to court to note a judgment. The judgment is simply emailed to you once the judge has, has, has completed the matter. All the judge need to do is read the papers, make a decision, write up a judgment and, and, and send out the judgment. And again, it seems to me, uh, having regard to what I said earlier about uh, pro bono judges, that uh, this, this may be a, um, a, a more efficient way to, to approach opposed motions. So the um, uh, virtual courts um, then to me um, have called into question a lot of the uh, preconceptions that we harbour about court hearings, the nature of court hearings, um, many of which it seems to me have uh, little or no apparent purpose. I'll come back to the to the to the um, example of coming to note judgment. You know, in the two big cases I referred to, uh, in, in the uh, AMCU Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs matter, for example, uh, if I had had to hand down judgment in open court, we'd have ten counsel all there simply to note judgment. And as you know, when a written judgment is handed down, it's simply a reading of the order, and the parties then collect their hard copy and and and. Uh, and, and go home. That, that to me uh, is just a massive and unjustifiable waste of time, money and resources. So what I want to suggest to you, and I'd be interested in your comments and your questions, is that, is that if we are to resolve the problem of an increasing demand on the Labour Court services and the diminishing resources, and believe me, those resources are diminishing by the day. Uh, it's clear to me that uh, some of the lessons that I've certainly learned uh, during the course of the lockdown may um, well uh, be learned um, by adapting the availability of virtual platforms uh, to contributing uh, in a number of ways um, to the challenge that we currently face. Thank you. A um, little over my time, but I'm going to hand over to Judge Gush. Thank you. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Andre. Uh, Judge Finico's point about SAS law and its importance to the to the judiciary and to the actual system, the labor law system, cannot be understated. The SAS law pro bono system is beneficial not only to the litigants who appear in court, they probably get the best free advice, the best advice they're going to get, and it's free of charge. The second issue is the question of the pro bono judges, and, and both of those are an essential part of, of trying to keep the backlog under control. Just as an aside, in Durban, I'm told by the registrar that there are 200 reviews that are outstanding that still have to be set down. If you work out that we set down under normal circumstances six to eight proposed reviews, a week, you can work out for yourselves how long it's going to take to deal with 200 reviews. Trials, uh, the registrar tells me sitting down trials in 2022 and the 2021 um, has already been uh, allocated. 
The difficulty with trials, and I'll come back to the issue of trials, because I'm not convinced that we cannot hold trials on a virtual platform. All you need is uh, an office of the court to be present when the witness is giving evidence to ensure that the, that the witness is not being interfered with or influenced, and the trials can proceed. But it doesn't justify the, the, the backlog we have, but just as a matter of interest, Richard Susskind wrote a very interesting article on, on, on virtual courts and virtual hearings. He says that there are four billion people are beyond, beyond the protection of lawyers, the law and the courts. In some countries, the backlog is staggering. 80 million cases in Brazil and 30 million cases in India. Well, we haven't got to that situation as yet, but it, it's, it's not acceptable that we have the delays that we have. The SAS Law Pro Bono Committee in Durban have established an office or virtual workstation where those who do not have facilities can operate from. It's often under, and not understood that if you're going to have a virtual court, if a virtual court is going to run efficiently, you need decent bandwidth and decent connectivity, and you need the facilities and, and the equipment to participate in a virtual hearing. I've no doubt that if that is extended to the rest of the country, it will assist. In Brazil, for example, they, they call them help centers, where parties who are going to participate in virtual hearings go to the help center, and they are then able to participate in a hearing using, in, those, in that case, the, the state's facilities. But the situation in Durban is that if a party, and we have many unrepresented parties in, in the Labour Court, if a party is unrepresented or doesn't have the facilities, they can make use of the pro bono facilities in the pro bono office that says law set up. And I think that is really a, a step in the right direction. It's created access to, to the virtual to virtual hearings. I want to deal just briefly with the, the nature of the hearings and, and just look at some of the experiences overseas as well as in this country. It seems to me that the behavior on on the, in a virtual hearing is, is often strange. Um, like Twitter and Facebook, people issue statements or say things that they immediately regret and then publish apologies. Quite why that behavior occurs, I have no idea. One's got to avoid the Jeffrey Tubin type situations, obviously. And it's also interesting that in the in the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, they held their first hearing. It was a, a, a matter involving trademarks. Well, some of the judges in, in that matter forgot to switch off their phones, forgot to switch on their phones. But by and large, it was accepted that it actually worked. Uh, in fact, Judge Clarence Thomas spoke for the first time in well over a year. He hasn't said much during his appointment and he waxed lyrical uh, during the virtual hearing. The issue though with, with hearings is that one needs to ensure that the hearings are conducted in a way that is conducive to, to a proper hearing. The interesting point is that prior to the, the lockdown, it seems that there was a, almost a universal rejection of virtual hearings. Suskin says that until a few weeks ago, most judges and lawyers rejected the idea of non-physical courts, denying that remote hearings could be fair or even technically feasible. The, then the virus came, courts closed, and it only took a fortnight um, to, to then start virtual hearings. He says that something like 80% of the hearings in Britain are now conducted virtually. The, there are certain guidelines and certain issues that need to be complied with if one's going to, going to run virtual hearings. You need to have proper uh, facilities, you need to have the, the, um, the connectivity, you need to have, have um, the, the wherewithal in order to participate in the hearing. Otherwise, it, you end up with a situation like some Southern American evangelical church where people are calling out, can you hear me, Lord? Can you hear me, Lord? It's, it's a difficult situation for, for people who don't have those facilities, which, as I said, can be dealt with by, by the SAS Law Committee setting up the offices. Clearly, it should be the state that's setting them up, but as most of you will know, the uh, the judiciary has had limited access to its email for um, weeks on end. I'm working virtually from home and I've been using my private email because I didn't have a connection to the to the judiciary uh, email. It's not ideal. 
But I'm, my experience of, of the virtual hearings is that if you see the three parties, and I, I use only exclusively Zoom, you see the, the faces of the parties who are arguing the matter, assuming there are only two, it makes it easier, obviously. But the faces don't freeze when they're not speaking. You can see the responses. And it's, it's the same as being in court to all intents and purposes. People address the court, they deal with the matter. And you then, as Andre says, you give a judgment uh, which can be emailed. It doesn't have to be handed down. Some of the tips uh, from various countries, in, in Australia, for example, they, they talk about um, ensure there's sufficient internet connection, uh, ensure that your that where you are speaking from is private, um, and you limit interference and and distractions. That you should mute your microphone when not addressing the court. I'm not so sure that that's necessary. I mean, a measure of interruption has always been part of our court process, and um, it's just the way that things work. The electronic materials must be available to the court, and that's something I want to dwell on for a, for a while. The the issue of providing the court with a bundle of documents, it can be done electronically. It, it is, can be somewhat difficult if, if, if one is using only a laptop and you have a small screen, but essentially if the court is provided with decent facilities, you'd be able to have electronically <coughs> the documentation. The issue of, of heads of argument, clearly if you're going to have the matter heard virtually, then you need heads of argument and you argue based on your heads of argument. If you're going to have the matter dealt with simply on the papers, it's necessary for counsel or those appearing for the parties to file their written argument, not copious quantities of written argument, but essentially set out what the argument is and set out the authorities that you rely on, which is what heads of argument should in any event be. The, uh, the, one of the other points in Australia is that the recording of proceedings, if proceedings are going to be recorded, it's necessary to introduce yourself. It's necessary that that is on record so the transcript can can um, can be accurate and deal with those issues. It's basically the same as in court. The issue of pre-trial considerations is also something that that needs to be considered. Proper preparation for a virtual hearing is necessary because you can't simply stand a matter down very easily to enable the parties to discuss issues, to enable the parties to exchange documents. And so the pre-trial considerations or pre-hearing considerations of the bundle of documents, it's preferable that the parties agree a common bundle. It's preferable that both parties file uh, concise heads. And it's preferable that the parties confine themselves to the uh, to the issues in question. Clearly, you have to set a timetable for matters because you can't have people waiting around on some sort of virtual waiting room waiting to be heard. So what I've been doing is, is allocating times for the hearings to take place. And you allocate, if you're doing four post motions, you allocate them an hour apart, which to some extent curtails the amount of argument. But proper pre-trial preparation would obviate that that is an issue. Just as an aside, the confidentiality issue, which is often raised as one of the arguments against uh, um, hearings, uh, virtual hearings, doesn't really apply in court matters. They, they're matters of public, uh, they're open to the public. It's only in arbitrations that confidentiality becomes, becomes an issue. The last issue I want to deal with, and that is um, the practice direction that's been issued by the uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal, the President of the Supreme Court of Appeal. It's worth looking at. Those of you that have appeared in, in, in the SCA will know what they're about. If you search it on the internet, it has it deals with an introduction and then it deals with the, um, the guidelines for conducting a virtual hearing. It's worth, a, it's worth careful consideration and it does in fact set out what the principles of the hearing are. Just to recap, the cost savings that Judge Vinikic has mentioned are massive. This is a court of, of national jurisdiction. People in Kimberley often file applications in Durban. Reasons for that are, are sometimes opaque. But the fact of the matter is that if you have virtual hearings, it's quite possible to conduct a matter from Kimberley where the parties don't need to leave Kimberley. 
Uh, they don't need to incur the travel costs and the matter can be heard in any of the courts without much difficulty. So I, I think the future does lie in virtual hearings. I think the fact that uh, the court is now accommodating them and we're finding our way somewhat slowly, but with decent facilities and decent connectivity from all the parties, I'm sure that it is probably the only way we're ever going to address the backlog. I doubt whether the country has the the wherewithal to appoint additional judges and to create different uh, additional courtrooms. And I think we're going to be stuck with virtual hearings for some time. The last issue I want to raise is just the issue of trials. I know in Durban, uh, for reasons best known to the registrar, all the trials have been extended, they've been um, removed from the roll. That's created a massive problem with, with the hearing of trials. I'm not convinced that trials cannot be dealt with um, virtually. I think the parties need to agree on the issues to be decided, agree on the witnesses to be called, and then set up a system whereby the witnesses can give evidence under the supervision of an officer of the court. The court is, is able to, to observe the witnesses giving evidence. The, you'd obviously need a camera for the witness and a camera for the for the counsel leading the, leading the evidence. And that's the same as in any court. So it's not an insurmountable problem dealing with trials. And I wholly endorse what, what Judge Finnick has said about pro bono judges dealing with matters uh, on uh, either on the papers or virtually. And I'm sure that's the only way we're ever going to address the backlog. SAS law has a massive responsibility in assisting in that. Thank you for your attendance. We have a few questions that have come in. Um, I think I'll ask it and then um, you can let me know which of you wants to answer. <laughs> um, the first one is from um, Batandwa. Um, how can the virtual meetings method be affected in a manner that will make courts more efficient? Post-corona, is the Labour Court more eager now to go more technological? Example, submitting pleadings online. Um, and there was a similar question as well as, uh, is there any chance the Labour Court may go on to the case line system like the High Court? So perhaps if you can address those two together. Well, perhaps, perhaps I can address that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, look, the, 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 the issue of electronic filing uh, is a related but separate issue. I mean, there have been initiatives that have been conducted over the last two, three years, and Judge Maurice Lee was one of the judges driving this process and uh, has continued to do so in the Gauteng High Court. Um, frankly, don't expect anything from the Office of the Chief Justice or the Department of, of, of Justice and Constitutional Development. We've been promised electronic case filing for years. Uh, indeed, one of the first Microsoft team meetings I had, I think, which was in in uh, in June, if I remember correctly, during, during the recess, was a training session on the use of case lines. Um, now that's all very well when <laughs> when you've got case lines installed and uh, and and operative, but but it isn't. So, uh, you know, case lines, yes, obviously it's, um, it, it would uh, contribute massively to the Labour Court's efficiency if parties were able to file documents electronically and if files were electronic and judges were able to access those files during the course of a hearing electronically. Um, from what I understand, that's where the Office of the Chief Justice uh, intends to go. But um, as I said to you earlier, I mean, that's been the case for, I don't know what, David, two, three years? Longer than that. I, I just don't see any visible progress, certainly not in respect of the Labour Court, which uh, frankly seems to be treated as something of a Cinderella Court by the OCJ. Um, and again, it comes it comes back, and one of the, one of the to, to what Judge Gough said, and it's one of the themes I, I want to hammer this afternoon. So, says law carries a responsibility. You are the users of the court. Oh, why, why, <laughs> why do you put up with the the inefficiencies that exist and the inefficiencies which, over the course of years, are, are simply simply remain unaddressed? And until parties apply pressure, I'm very pessimistic about uh, 
about uh, the introduction of any new systems or, or, or any greater uh, efficiencies uh, that uh, that other courts might have the benefit of. Just as an aside, Kenya has just introduced e-filing for their courts. There's no reason why we shouldn't have the same thing, but Judge Vinicius right, there's been no movement. I've heard about e-filing for at least eight or nine years, and it never happened. And it's the only way that you can run it, but the issue that we can address is the issue of the hearings and the virtual hearings. That at least can address some of the backlog, albeit that we're running on an antiquated system of paper filing. Um, so, so on that note, um, a question from Anonymous. Um, the use of mediators for matters has been helpful as we tend to settle before the steps of court, mainly trials. Can matters be allocated to independent persons per Brno judges to mediate before the set down of the matter? It's a very difficult issue. People have the right to go to court and, you know, to impose mediation on them, it's almost descending to the realms of the CCMA. Uh, what parties need to do as opposed to the mediation issue is to, in fact, consider very carefully what their case is about. More often than not, trials settle. And the trials settle because the attention is given to the details and the, and the niceties of the case at the time that the matter is going to be heard. So from, from a trial point of view, pre-trial processes would lead to more matters being settled. If the parties want the matter to be mediated, that's, they must ask for it. And the, the, I've no doubt that, that the judges who are, are dealing with these matters would happily intervene and mediate it. But the point is, is that on a trial basis, parties are really the authors of their own fortune. If you prepare properly for a trial close to the time, you know exactly what your case is about, you know what your opponent's case is about. And if there's a prospect of settlement, then one needs to enter into that settlement. But if you've been allocated five days and you settle the matter on the Monday, you've wasted effectively four court days, if not four and a half court days. Days that could have been used to deal with, uh, with applications. And that, I don't know what the answer to that is. Judge Benico says it's the right of the party, and he's right. You could the right of the parties to settle on the courtroom steps. It's just well, sad. It, no, I think, I think the, the part, part of the answer, and it's a much deeper um, issue um, is is efficient case management from the outset. And again, that's another that's another topic that's been on the table for years. You know, case management by judges and various courts have tried to introduce various case management systems. I mean, we've tried um, over, over over the years to um, to to introduce a degree of case management in in labour court trials. It it just hasn't worked out. Uh, there's no coherent system. There's no uh, there's no commitment by anybody to the process, and I, I can tell you what the consequences are. I mean, I call the trial roll in Johannesburg every week, twice a week. Um, technically, we have uh, three trial judges. We have five days, so that gives us 15 call them trial days every week. This week we may have used two and a half. Last week we used one. Um, the week before I was in P, but I understand that nothing ran. And, you know, one needs to start asking questions uh, because we can't sit with a backlog that uh, in, in, in terms of which the registrar will allocate you a trial date in 2022 when we've got two judges sitting in their allocated weeks doing nothing because nothing runs. And it's, 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 it's the kind of case where, uh, I'll give you an example from a case this week. Oh, well, you know, these, this bundle was served on Sunday afternoon. This is on Monday morning. You know, I need to take instructions. Um, this subpoena was delivered, you know, on, on Friday night. You know, the trial's on Monday. And there's a bun fight about, about the validity of the subpoena. Or parties are, are simply come to court. I mean, just not in a position to run. And the longer these un, um, longer these 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 cases that are not ripe for hearing just keep getting set down um, and 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 not running, uh, this this problem is going to persist. 
Well, of course, uh, you know, as I said to you, the, ultimately the solution is a proper case management so that we know that when a case is enrolled for a trial, it is going to run. But of course, you know, the last minute on the steps of the court settlements and one, one always gets those and, 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 we, um, and, and we encourage those. Uh, at the moment, we encourage them because we adopt the SAA business model of enrollment, which is you overbook the passengers um, and uh, hope that, uh, you know, two of the five are, are going to fall off the bus. At the moment, four of the five are falling off the bus, um, which is, as I said, a, a massive waste of a massive waste of resources, which we, we, we cannot afford in this environment to uh, to, to waste. So yes, a, a decent case management system, but uh, us mere mortal judges are not in a position to introduce uh, those. And, you know, perhaps says law ought to have a discussion with the judge president and see how we can um, how we can address that issue because it's something that needs to be addressed very urgently. Um, you may have, have just addressed this question, but but just to ask it um, from Chris Todd, um, are there any one regulatory obstacles to proceeding with remote hearings as a norm and two practical obstacles or considerations that the profession can help resolve to make this happen? Well, David, if I can chip in, I mean, ideally, I, I, I've been thinking about this and 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 I mean, some some kind of directive, I think, would be a good idea, uh, simply because that uh, sets out some norms and it um, it's, it sets out the circumstances in which virtual hearings um, can be sought. And, and uh, I, I you know, would be happy to work with anybody um, on, on the terms of, um, of, of, of a directive. But uh, I mean, it seems to me that, again, the impetus should come from the users of the court. Um, and unless, unless the initiative comes from you, there, there is going to be no initiative. Uh, let, let me be frank. I think the, the yeah, I, I agree. I don't think there's any bar to virtual hearings taking place. The manner in which they take place and the rules that are applicable are really the rules that the parties need to agree. Uh, a directive could well be the answer. But, you know, if you look at the directive that the SCA issued right at the beginning of, of, of the pandemic, it, it it's not perfect. The judges sit in different locations and that creates difficulties because they can't converse with each other. But a simple set of rules that we could incorporate into a directive that comes from the users of the court um, would, would go a long way towards uh, ensuring that the virtual hearings continue, that the backlog is addressed. You know, we have no interest in, in the way in which the parties wish to conduct it other than to ensure that it's done fairly and properly. As I've said, I find Zoom hearings very similar to court. You have the, the faces of the parties who are appearing. Um, that's all I'm interested in. I don't want to hear anyone else or see anyone else. And if they switch off their <coughs> cameras and mute their microphones, it's the two <coughs> parties in most cases are myself. And I find that quite straightforward and quite simple. Obviously, trials are the issue. And I really believe that if the if SASL can come up with proposals as to how trials be, can, can be conducted virtually, a directive of that issue would ensure that one could then deal with those trials. And that would go a long way towards saving court days and go a long way towards enabling the court to set down more, uh, more applications to be heard. And we wouldn't be wasting the number of days we are present. Right, let me, see if I can chip in, uh, let, let me just be clear. I mean, I, I would support the terms of, di of a directive which set out the, the how are we are going to do this? You know, uh, use the circumstances in which, uh, you know, opposed motions will be argued, trials will be run, etc. But what I, I'm arguing for is something at a, at a high level. And, and that is, that is, that is um, using a virtual platform uh, to replace some of the proceedings and some of the protocols that exist um, for, for, for me, simply for historical reasons or because they exist. We need to rethink about the way in which um, in, in which uh, the, the court's roles are, are managed and we need to think about how virtual hearings can help us do that. It's, it's not a question of um, only of, um, of, of etiquette. 
and 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 uh, you know how we how we going to conduct a trial on 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 Zoom. It's 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 uh, it's it's how we can use Zoom or Microsoft Teams uh, in order to um, improve. Uh, efficiencies uh, in the system by questioning existing existing uh, procedures and protocols and by eliminating those which uh, continue to be inefficient. Um, so, so on that, um, Ludwig did say, do you agree that using virtual hearings could result in pro bono judges being used to hear, for example, unopposed applications weekly between four and seven to seek to deal with the backlog? Is the court willing to consider such an approach? Well, I'm not the court. You need, you need to ask the judge president, but I would, I would frankly be delighted you know, one of one of the other things, and I tried to I refer to it obliquely. One of the other lessons to be learned, you know, is, is that is is that we needn't be confined to the hours of between ten o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, some of these hearings, uh, I mean, I've conducted at uh, at midnight. You know, we've had urgents. Uh, I mean, previously if there was an urgent at nine o'clock at night. You know, I would dress up, put on a suit, and drive to the court. Put on my robe, sit down, and uh, we'd hear the case. I mean, that just now seems to me to be bizarre. Um, there's no reason why uh, that shouldn't be done uh, at, at nine o'clock at night or at midnight, as, as, as the one case I had was. Uh, equally, um, I, I gave the example of, of being able to get a judgment out to parties who wanted uh, the judgment out as a matter of urgency by pressing send. Uh, the judgment went out to 10 council and 20 attorneys um, located from you know White River to Pretoria to Santon to Cape Town. Um, all of those constraints on, on, on existing protocols and, and procedures um, have effectively been removed. And there's no reason why pro bono judges can't uh, take a pile of files and sit from four to seven and go through them, uh, especially the, the, the kind of fast track system I was arguing for earlier where parties agree to have matters determined on paper. I mean, that just frees up a judge, pro bono or, or otherwise, I mean, to deal with the file uh, whenever you get a moment. And uh, that, that may be uh, during the course of the evening. Um, you know, again, we need to just move away from this notion that we do justice between 10 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. Um, can you tell us how the pro bono judges are appointed? Um, not really. They're appointed by the um, by the judge president, and uh, well, ultimately by the minister, but on the recommendation of the judge president. But uh, Saslow, uh, in, I think, in consultation with the judge president, has a list of criteria that he applies, and it it uh, it, it uh, Claire, perhaps you can you can help us here. But as far as I can recall, it's uh, it's someone who has a minimum number of years uh, experience. It's largely an experience based uh, qualification. Um, um, sorry, yeah, that's correct. Um, our, the criteria that we came up with um, a few years ago when we assisted the court with this project was that attorneys who had 10 years post Arsenal's experience and had done quite a lot of work in the Labour Court were added to a list, which is linked to, to the judge president and deputy judge president for their consideration. Okay, but, but again, see if I can just chip in. You know, the, the, this is this is is a a marvelous opportunity to um, where supply and demand can meet because uh, you know practitioners are required to put in pro bono hours, and we would be able to make um, uh, let's call them cases available for you to do in you know, in, in in your own homes or chambers or offices. Um, and, and again, particularly those where where there is no argument to be presented. Um, you know, th those you, those those pro bono hours could be could be knocked off in an area which uh, is 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 one uh, in in which you in in which you uh, specialise and have have particular skills and experience, and um, you know that would that would certainly uh, that would certainly assist us. Another question from Anthony Solomon. Um, in dealing with matters only on the papers, a protocol for judges which allows them to be required to communicate with parties should they be deciding a matter on an issue not concisely raised in heads 
would go a long way to persuading practi um, practitioners as to the prospect of forfeiting in person hearings. Yeah, I think I think that's an excellent point. And again, it's one of those things we could put in a directive. So you know, and again, it's consistent with um, with uh, ordinary judicial protocols. If you're going to decide a matter on a point that hasn't been raised in the heads, you provide your obligation, ethical obligation, is to provide parties with an opportunity to make submissions on that point. So it's it's simply a question of of recording. I think what's already an existing protocol and and applying it. But uh, you know, as far as possible, I, I think we should be encouraging. Uh, especially reviews to be heard um, without uh, oral hearings. And I, I say that because the, the primary function in a review uh, is to take the award in one hand, the record in the other, and determine the relationship of reasonableness between the two. You have the benefit of, of, of written argument. And uh, again, in my experience, I mean, uh, oral submissions in court, there are very few cases. There are cases, but they, 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 are, they, are, they are few where um, any kind of advocacy actually um, is uh, ma manages to to uh, result in in a, in a different conclusion. Um, I, you know, if, everything's everything's been said, everything's been recorded, and uh, it's for the judge simply to make make a decision. But yeah, you're right. Judges shouldn't be um, pulling out points that uh, that that haven't been the subject of uh, of submissions made by the parties, or at least an invitation to make submissions. Got a really to that effect, a directive that deals with how that communication takes place is, is relatively straightforward. But again, it must be, it would be helpful if it came from the practitioners who, who make that suggestion. Yeah. Rod Harper has asked a significant number of cases are opportunistic and without merit. If the Labour Court was more forceful on costs orders, this would indicate that there is risk and could reduce the number of cases. Surely this approach would assist? Yeah, Rod, regrettably, we all bound by the Constitutional Court's decisions. Yeah. And they take a different view from what I can ascertain. I would love to make more orders for costs uh, because you're right. Uh, a lot of what comes into the court shouldn't come into the court. Um, and that that was one one of the reasons why the the old um, uh, what was called the pre-enrollment hearing system um, what was was intended to address. Uh, just to say, what are your grounds for review? You're not happy with the award. I'm sorry, that doesn't meet the Sedumo test. Your case is dismissed. Um, we 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 don't have the capacity to filter out cases. People have a right to come to court. And uh, unless uh, they're acting in bad faith, frivolously, maliciously, I, I can't see much scope for the court taking on, uh, you know, the, the filtering role by by issuing uh, automatic um, orders for for costs. But again, in my experience, a vast number of cases that come to court are simply there because it's the next next step in the process. Party loses an arbitration, goes to the CCMA, they send them to the Labour Court. And I mean, to the extent that we have a pro forma application for review and a pro forma affidavit, it's 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 simply seen as yet another step in the process. Um, it's at, at cost at cost to at cost to the employer and ultimately at cost to institutions like the CCMA and the Labour Court. Um, a comment from um, Ingrid Lewin. Um, in the early 90s, IMSSA had what we called Settlement Week to get rid of the old industrial court backlog where practitioners volunteered to mediate by way of agreement between the parties and then arbitrate under the Arbitration Act. We had about 20 or so volunteers and it worked so well. If the Registrar of the Labour Court is willing, we could perhaps set that up again. All that is needed is to set um, is a set of, set up of an admin system could also be done virtually. Um, and yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with that, except that uh, the registrar is not the right person to approach. We need to talk to the judge president. But uh, that, that I mean, I recall I recall that intervention and it, it was very successful. And there's no reason why a similar intervention uh, ought not to meet with the same success. I've often I've often said the pro bono clinic shouldn't be where it is. It should it should be between 
the, uh, the 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 lifts, the elevators, and the security checkpoint. But you know, people unfortunately get to the front desk and file their cases, and pro bono gets involved on the day of the hearing. Um, it would, <laughs> some kind of intervention at a much earlier stage, I, I, I think, would be uh, of of great a great 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 assistance. And I mean, the one thing I've learned about legal aid, uh, again, just observing um, the, the the operation of the pro bono clinic, is that it, it's it's as much about education as it is about as a, about uh, providing legal assistance. So if someone can explain that, uh, you know, yes, your unhappiness with the award, we all understand, but it's not a ground for review. Um, perhaps you know we could cut down on what's coming into the court. Um, a last question from Chris Todd. Um, what are the main reasons why case management for trials hasn't been effective? Uh, would it be possible for judges to take a more active stance towards early case management? Um, Chris, I'll come back to the same point I, I made earlier. Uh, it's not for individual judges to apply a case management system. It requires a um, some kind, it requires some sort of intervention from from the top. Uh, it's hard as an individual judge when you get allocated your file on a Monday morning and, and someone says, here's your trial. Uh, effect any case management. Uh, you, you can try and mediate and you can try and uh, uh, make suggestions that uh, you know perhaps the merits are not as strong as uh, the applicant thinks. But uh, a systemic case, a, a system of case management, and that's what's required. Uh, needs to needs to come from the top, and it's 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 way way overdue. Case management has been a topic for discussion as long as I can remember, and I think the only court that deals with any form of case management is is the Gauteng Court under Judge Mlumba. The German courts don't, as far as I'm aware, don't have any case management system. So it, Needs it needs to be properly introduced and properly managed and properly ruled. All right. Anything else? Just I didn't mention downsides, David. I don't know what your experience has been, but uh, virtual hearings for me has, has, has two major disadvantages. The one is the one is that you it's 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 more difficult to intervene, and. Um, I, I, I like to intervene, particularly to um, get to the point um, when you have to wave at parties and say, is this, are you really saying this or what about this or what about that? Or I don't want to hear about this. Tell me about that. Um, it's much easier to do that in open court than it is on, on Zoom where you are, because of the nature of, of, of the of, of the intervention, you you um, you 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 more compelled to uh, sit and listen, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes. <laughs> the other is that is that uh, it's very difficult to give extemporary judgments. And yeah. I was just looking for at some figures today. I, I think between um, May and the end of October, those six months, I, I wrote. I've, I think I wrote ninety two or ninety three judgments. Um, and you know, ordinarily you would just give an extemporary judgment in court, uh, but it's it's hard to do that on uh, it's hard to do that on Zoom. But that that's that's for me the two downsides. But um, you know, otherwise, um, I think I, said, I think the system has got great potential. You can give COVID judgments, which are sort of somewhere between an extemporary and a reserved judgment. Mm. Thanks. I'm going to hand um, over to Claire now for the the raffle. Um, thank you for dealing with those questions. Thank you very much, Di. Thanks for asking the questions, and thank you to all the delegates who asked questions to encourage the discussion. Very important. I think um, the pro bono judges, uh, sorry, the pro bono directors and the national committee will meet. To um, uh, discuss what was um, brought up today by the judges, and thanks again to the both of you for your your support. 
Before we get on to the raffle prizes, I'd also like to just take this opportunity to thank the attorneys who participate in this project all around the country and for being flexible and agile and responsive during the COVID time um, when we transformed the project from physical to online. And we have a hybrid kind of approach going at the moment um, in Johannesburg office, um, particularly. And it's actually working very well, and um, we are managing to to cope with the number of of clients who are coming into our offices. And as you can imagine, that number is only just increasing. So thank you again to the attorneys and to our sponsors, Weber Wentzel, Cliffdecker, Bowman, Simply, who support the project, and um, Lexus, Nexus, and Labanet for the prizes for today. So as I mentioned earlier, for those who worked online, um, Judge Benito used a random selector app on his phone and various numbers were um, drawn. And I'm pleased to say that the first prize, which was the Lexus Nexus ebook called Litigation Skills for South African Lawyers, um, that prize was won by Tracy Van Der Kopf from State McKenzie. Then the next prizes, which are three take-a-lot vouchers, have been won by Adil Patel from Cliffhead Hoffman, Neil Phil from Saskin, and Richard Madden from Rikers Innis. Santa has kindly donated two Nest Forest vouchers, and those have been won by Advocate Peter Kern from the Eastern Cape Bar, and Leon Pretorius from Uata. And the last two prizes, which is free attendance at Santa seminars and webinars in 2021, uh, go to Michelle Jacobs from Jacobson Associates in Port Elizabeth and Sandile July at Worksman in Johannesburg. Thanks everybody for your time. Anything else from the two judges before we close off? Just take your says law and keep up the good work. It really is a, a very, very helpful and very good initiative. Yeah, and just, just from me, uh, again, uh, we started out here, but thank you very much indeed for your support. It, it, is, it is really valued uh, and, and uh, an essential component of, um, of, our, of our functioning. Um, thank you very much. And just to reiterate, I think what, uh, what David was saying earlier and what I've been trying to say is that I, I think, um, you know, if, if there's to be if we are to take advantage of uh, the opportunities that have been made available to us, and I've tried to sketch a few, um, it, it really is up to SAS law as users of the court uh, to come and push for those. Uh, it's, it's hard to do it from the inside, as I've discovered. Thank you, Judge. We hear you. And um, we'll close off with the judges saying thank you uh, in February, when we started on the 4th of February 2011 in the Johannesburg office with our pilot project. And uh, we look forward to another further 10 years and hopefully uh, finding a way to assist the court in being more efficient. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Be well, take care, and all the best for the end of the year. Thank you. Bye. Bye.